Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. Before we introduce our returning champion guest, I would like to give a shout out to our presenting chess education sponsors, chessable.com. And as you guys may have heard before, I have a list of my favorite chessable courses. And guess what? There's a new favorite, starting out with 1D4 by a certain Grandmaster Ben Feingold, as we will be discussing among many other topics. But you can also see my favorites related for different rating levels. Um, different subjects, little capsules guiding you. So check that out and check out all their other new material. I legitimately can't keep up. Grandmaster Yoon Ludwig Hammer has a new course on the NIMZO um, and there's tons of other fun stuff coming. We've got some more guests in the pipeline as well. But without further ado, let's introduce you to our five-time guest, two-time US Open co-champ, two-time National Open co-champ, 2002 World Open co-champion. He's a Twitch star, a YouTube char, star a husband of the rising poker star karen boyd and now a chessable author welcome back grandmaster ben feingold thanks ben it's great to be here again i'm glad i'm your five-time guest yeah what an honor of, of all your accomplishments but uh, that might be the greatest one yeah <laughs> i think it's the uh the chessable course which we'll get to momentarily and for listeners ben and i might be a little weary we actually tried to tr stream this on his twitch channel but uh after 45 minutes of uh of tech problems we had to resign so we resigned we're not live streaming it but of course this is available on all your platforms and we're going to dive right in so ben i'm going to start you out with a hard-hitting question this time uh from a friend of the podcast the ono zone patreon supporter as well so he asks if you ever regret dedicating your life to chess or think about the opportunity cost of doing so and on a similar note he wonders what do you think about adult improvers dedicating big chunks of their own free time to a game they will at best be semi decent? And what does he think? What do you think is wrong with such people, if anything? Well, the first question, uh, no, I don't regret because you know it's life, and you you choose the way you live your life, and you can always make a lot of different choices. But there's no reason to regret the choices you made because that's basically who you are. And I was born in a chess family, as my dogs will um, <laughs> agree with. And I mean, that's that's what I do is I do chess stuff. So I don't regret that at all. And I've done different chess stuff because I've played chess. I've taught chess. I've done commentary in St. Louis. I do commentary from Twitch, streaming now, chessable. I mean, chess, is, chess really had, hit a big boon, uh, you know, the last... You know, three or four years. So I, I can't complain that I'm in the chess business. Now, your second question, um, I have sort of the same answer. Um, if adult learners want to spend a lot of time on chess, then they're doing what they want to do. And some will see a lot of progress, some won't see as much. And that's, that's life. So you, you sort of want to you do what you want to do. And if you're not progressing, you can always do something else or keep at it. And uh, I mean, that's, that's the way life is. And you, you can, if you, if you regret what you're doing, you can always do something else. Yeah. It's, it's a tricky question. I mean, I think it's certainly normal to have some doubts if you're spending a lot of time on the game, but I also, I feel like there's beauty in finding something that captivates you. you know, like a lot of people don't have that. So when you find it, I do think, um, it can be worth pursuing. But Ben, I want to follow up because obviously, as we've talked about in prior interviews, um, you're, you know, you're pretty successful these days. You've built quite a following. But were there periods younger in your life when you were still finding your footing? Did you ever have any regrets about putting so much into chess at those points? Yeah, I mean, for most of my my chess, quote unquote, career, um, I was, uh, you know, poor and Chess tournaments didn't pay a lot. Lessons didn't pay a lot. And, you know, I liked playing chess and I like traveling to different tournaments, different countries. So, you know, it's, I think doing, doing what you, what you love is, is more important than money. And hopefully doing what you love will pay you a lot of money at some point. Um, so I, I don't have any regrets in, in, in that vein, but I mean, probably, at least half of my chess career was trying to figure out like how to pay the rent and how to afford my next meal. Cause that's, that's the nature of chess from, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And now that there's 
you know, the internet and, and streaming and giving lessons online and other chessable chess.com, other ways to make money. Um, it's a lot easier now for somebody like me. Um, but yeah, I mean, before that, when it was just go to a weekend tournament and you need to win your last round to be able to, to eat the next day, that those, those were difficult times, but that's, that's, that's the decision I made. And I think I'm a lot happier with that than a lot of other people I know who quit chess and decided to make money and not really doing something that that's engaging to them that they really enjoy. Yeah. I mean, at this point, you've got the best of both worlds. Um, so are you in touch with a lot of, I mean, I know like in prior interviews, your, your friend, I am Stuart Rachel's has come up. Um, but, and obviously he's, you know, successful professor, but, um, have you, are you in touch with a lot of, uh, former chess players who are checking in on the chess world? Uh, I keep in touch with Patrick Wolf and, uh, and, and Stuart, as you said, um, Patrick's actually playing in the senior championship, which is this month, I think in St. Louis. Um, so he's actually playing chess, which is, uh, he plays in the senior championship when he can. That's about the only tournament he plays in. I think I saw he was um, playing an event in California. I mean, he lives in California, but in the Bay yeah. Area uh, um, recently as well. So maybe he's dipping his toe in a little bit more. or Maybe he just wanted to warm up for the seniors. Yeah, so. probably warm up. And what's funny is occasionally uh, on chess.com when I'm playing Blitz, I get paired with Adam Leaf, who's um, a colleague of mine from the U.S. Junior Championships, who like doesn't play chess anymore, but he plays on chess.com. Right. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of people do that, that quote unquote quit chess. They'll play some blitz online and uh, they follow chess. They just aren't playing professionally because, you know, life got in the way. Yeah. But I was one of the few people from my generation uh, of kids playing in the juniors every year that actually went on to just do chess full time. And I wasn't the strongest. I mean, Patrick Wolf and Fishbein and, uh, and uh, Stuart Rachels were always better than me, but Fishbein somehow mixed the two. He plays chess all the time and he works all the time. Yeah. So somehow, I mean, obviously he's not as good as he used to be because he's not probably studying chess very much. He plays for fun, but he never really quit chess. He just got a job, raised a family and somehow played chess all the time also. Yeah. Also kind of the, the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and Ben, so you mentioned Patrick playing in the seniors. Um, I know you're retired, although I also saw you played in a tournament in March. And I apologize if you explain this on stream, but uh, what's the story behind the local tournament you played in March? That that was a blitz tournament. Oh, it wasn't okay. low chess. Yeah, no. and just because me and Archer and Karen went up to our old chess club. That's where that was our chess club, and it was it was we sold it, and we hadn't played there. And I figured since Karen and Archer were playing, I would just join them. Okay. I missed that it was a blitz tournament. Now, my real question was, being that you turned 54, uh, I believe in October. Um, Close, do you, September. September. Do you get tempted to play in um, to play in senior events, even while being no. semi-retired like Patrick does? No. No. I don't, I don't want to play any slow chess ever. Wow. Then people will, will see my games. That can't be good. Even avoiding the kids. Yeah, I avoid, I avoid everybody. But even in the Blitz tournament, where everybody was a thousand points less than me, all the games were super tough. I mean, but just, you're still 2,700 on, on chess.com. I mean, obviously, I know you're, you feel like you should play better, but, you know, that's pretty good. It, it's okay. But yeah, I, when I see the, uh, the strength of my moves and positions, then I, the rating doesn't affect me as much as how badly I play now. Okay. So you're, you're holding strong. Like when I interviewed Karen last year, we were saying, you know, maybe he'll get the, the, the bug at some point. And especially to the, I know we'll get to Karen's poker later, but to the extent that you're traveling with her to tournaments anyway, we thought, Oh, sooner or later, maybe he'll get bored. But right now you're saying that's not on the horizon. No, that's, that's not going to happen, man. Bummer. Well, as long as you guys still make it to tournaments and eventually I make it to one. Um, well, you're going to the national open, correct? Right. I'm working at the National Open. I'm doing a chess camp and a simul and some game analysis. My usual stuff at the National Open. It's a fun tournament. They're actually breaking records this year, attendance records. 
So they have a lot of tournaments there. It's a chess festival. They have a women's tournament, which already has 60 players, which is a record for them. And the National Open itself is going to have over 1,100 players, which is Amazing. also, I think, going to be a record. So people people are coming back into chess. Obviously, Vegas is a great location uh, for a chess tournament. And uh, it's National Open is becoming what it once was uh, before the pandemic when you know tournaments weren't well attended but now they seem to be people are starving for chess yeah and that's june 14th to 18th so uh mm -hmm. we'll be two days after we record this so if anyone i mean after this releases so if anyone hears this and wants to hightail it to vegas and uh <laughs> meet meet ben then by all means uh they should go for it so we have another uh listener question another question from our patreon supporter of the pod and this one is from roy lopes not Roy Lopez, but Roy Lopes. And mm -hmm. Roy, thanks for supporting the pod, Roy. He asks, according, so some of this you, you've discussed on stream and in prior interviews, but um, but it's always good to, to expound upon. He asks, according to your experiences, what are the best advice you gave to improving adult chess players besides never move the F-pawn? Well, it's, it's just never play F3 or F6. F4 <laughs> and F5 are fine. Um, the best advice I gave... Well, I think I think the best advice for any adult adult improver is to not get bogged down with uh, your rating and how how much it's going up or not going up, and enjoying the process of of playing chess again, and you know enjoying it and enjoying the the journey of studying chess and playing and trying to improve instead of worrying about what successes you've had um, from, from what you're doing. Otherwise <clears throat> people can get, uh, you know, perturbed and uh, have one bad tournament and decide it wasn't worth it when <clears throat> the journey itself is what makes it worth it. Studying and playing and trying to improve yourself and doing something different and coming back into chess. Cause a lot of people I know that are adult, you know, learners and improvers, were playing chess as a kid sometime in high school or college, they stopped, they got jobs and families, careers, and now they, they love chess again and they want to get better. And it's, it's good to per persevere and, and not, you know, think about what your result is all the time, but the enjoyment you get from studying and playing and being part of the chess community. And I think with the adult learners, you know, the chess punks, there's a big chess community there online. And they're all rooting for each other. And it makes makes you feel like you're part of some kind of family. So it's it's really nice for that, for that reason. And hopefully people won't get discouraged and and quit if they're not getting big successes right away. Because unlike when we were kids, kids are good now. So it's tough to play kids now. But that doesn't mean we can't still beat them sometimes. Yeah, it's a big difference. And what do you think, Ben? Like when you get frustrated because you're losing more games, um, you know, one might argue, at least I feel this way. I don't feel like I'm a worse player, but my, or like maybe I'm worse than my peak, but I feel like I'm basically where I, I'm average of where I was in say the 20 years since my peak, but my rating is at its low basically. Um, and I know that that's fairly common. Do you think that there's some that one should adjust? Like should these federations like FIDE and us chess think about adjusting the rating parameters or should we just deal with the fact that it's a, a moving target um, and that people as a whole are getting better at chess? Yeah. People are better at chess now because of all the opportunities with um, online stuff um, and traveling and, and so forth and coaching. Um, it's a lot easier to get coaching and good coaching. It's a lot cheaper, um, you know, with chessable and grandmaster coaches everywhere um, being available. Um, and, and, you know, it's easy to study chess online. So the people are better at chess now than they were, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. They, they play better moves. They understand more and they have more practice, you know, because of sites like, you know, chess.com can play chess 24 hours a day. I don't recommend, but some people do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously it's a different world and we have to adjust to that. and you know, we have to play our own game and work as hard as we can, although I'm retired, so I don't have to do that. But 
Um, yeah, if I ever wanted to get back into playing shape, it would take so much work from something from me, which I don't really want to do because I would never, I would never be as good as I used to be. And so you have to have the, the, the love of the game and the will to play. And I didn't, unlike a lot of adult learners and chess improvers, I didn't like take 25 years off and then say, okay, I'm coming back. Cause I love chess. I've always loved chess and I've always played. So I played in my teens, twenties, thirties, and forties. I was playing chess all the time. So it's not like I've missed out and I wasn't playing chess and now I'm hungering for playing chess again. I've, I've always played chess and I've always followed chess. And even in retirement, I'm playing on my stream. I'm playing dozens and dozens of games a week on, on the internet on chess.com. So I'm still, you know, chess still surrounds my life. It's just playing in classical tournaments isn't something that I'm looking to do. And, uh, I think the person who would agree with me the most is Greg Shahadi. Yeah, he was an early just adopter. Like classical chess. <laughs> yeah, an early adopter and hating, hating classical chess and wanting it to That's be right. moved, moved online. Uh, and just to read the rest of uh, Roy's comment, he he mentioned he's a big fan of your YouTube series on game reviews. They're always super instructive and entertaining. Mm -hmm. And I agree. I uh, especially well, love your you looks at players from the past. But Ben, I wanted to tell you, because hearing you discuss this, I'm thinking I... I I reviewed our prior interviews and you've given some, some good advice in this regard before where you said, for example, and I'm sure you say this on stream all the time, the two main things are to play tougher competition and to review the games extensively. Um, mm -hmm. But so I'm working on a book, which is sort of like the collected wisdom of uh, chess improvement wisdom, but I also tell some stories in it. And one of the stories I tell Ben, I stole one of your best stories. At least I think it's one of your best stories. You, you did in mm -hmm. our prior interview, call it your crowning chess achievement where you got to watch uh, Kasparov and Karpov do a post-mortem in oh, yeah, uh, I like Tilburg. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I stole that story. And in, um, in, you, in that interview, you mentioned that you wrote about it for Chess Life. So I'm like, oh, let me go look at the Chess Life archives since U.S. Chess graciously puts the whole archives. Mm -hmm. And so I found your write-up. There was nothing too illuminating in that write-up. But what struck me is in those four years where you were in Europe, you were writing and going to all these tournaments. You were like mm -hmm. traveling and covering these events all the time. So Yeah, must... I, I did stuff for Chess Life. And I also wrote for a Danish magazine, Skakblad it. And they just translated in, in, into Danish what I wrote. So they were asking me to do chess stuff also. Okay. And so was I was writing for more, than, for more than one publication at that time. Yeah. And it was a, typically the same events? Like you would cover one, one event for U.S. chess and concurrently be covering it for the Danish magazine? No, no it was different because some of the U.S. was like, you know, U.S. championship or, you know, U.S. Open or some American tournament and big tournaments uh, in Europe and occasionally they would be the same tournament that would happen. And then um, you get paid twice. That's right. I get two paychecks this way. Okay. Good Simpsons reference. <laughs> and the, uh, the Kasparov Karpov turn reference. Um, and again, listeners can go back and listen. I believe it was our second interview. Um, um, did you, were you just there as a reporter or were you playing? And I, I know you weren't in the elite section. No, but I, 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 I just went there to watch the tournament. And one of the Tilburg tournaments, I don't think it was that one. My mom came with me and she was just visiting because Spencer was just born. He was a baby and she was visiting. And I remember when we got there, I, I was pointing out some of the players to her. And I said, that's Anand. And she said, is he a grandmaster? So I was, I was like, yes, they're all grandmasters. <laughs> that, that was very impressive at that time. Um, but yeah, I, I would go to Tilburg, you know, it was like, like two and a half hours by train from where I lived. So I would just go and watch the tournament for a day and then come back just so I could just watch the tournament. Wasn't necessarily to report on it. Although in that instance, I think I was reporting on it. Okay. And what's your favorite tournament that you attended, like whether you played or just attended in that era? Wow. Favorite tournament. Um, I like the tournaments a lot in the Netherlands. Um, and I played in Vikonze. And at that time I played in the B group at that time, there was only the A and the B group. And now the B group is like 2,700 players, but back then the B group was, you know, like 2,400 to 2,600 right, right in my wheelhouse. And 
that was really well organized and the players were treated really well. Um, I like playing in Groningen, which is also in, in the Netherlands. And one of my best tournaments ever was the ORA tournament uh, in, in Amsterdam. Uh, and that was a really strong tournament. I think I was like the second lowest rated player in the tournament. And there were like 26 players. Um, so those are my favorite tournaments were probably in the Netherlands. They were really well organized and I like being in the Netherlands. Okay. And Ben, in our, in our 2021 interview, I had asked you about Mikhail Tal and you mentioned the world chess festival, 1988, mm -hmm. getting to see him play against Zapata. And mm -hmm. you also said that particular tournament we could do a whole podcast about. So what else come, we're not going to do a whole podcast, but what else comes to yeah. mind when you think of that tournament? Well, that's her, that was great. Cause that was a festival. They had two um, international tournaments where just lots of GMs played like basically two New York opens. You want to like wow. make a comparison. They had the candidates matches. All the best players in the world were there. And they had the world blitz championship, which was a knockout and then qualifying events. I almost qualified. And if I would have qualified, I would have been paired with Kasparov in the first round. Wow. So I would, I would have gotten knocked out, but <laughs> uh, that was amazing because all the best chess players in the world were there and tall won the world blitz championship and tall won $50,000, which I mean, now is chicken feet, but in 1988, $50,000 is the equivalent of 2 billion now. So, <laughs> I mean, $50,000 in a blitz tournament was unheard of uh in 1988 and so that's all the best players in the world played and <clears throat> my favorite first round pairing and favorite pairing of the whole tournament was round one shirazi karpov talk about two different styles of players and yeah karpov you know tore him limb from limb but that that was a great event the candidates matches were great uh the world blitz championship was great the internationals were great it lasted for a month and we were there the whole time we rented a house and we just, we, we played in all the tournaments we could. I was there with Fred Lindsay and Ray Stone, if you know those gentlemen. And uh, yeah, I mean, that was, it was really, really, really cold. I, I, you can't even understand how cold it was. You've, you've never, you've never been in such snowstorms, ice, 30 below zero because it was February in New Brunswick. Right. So that's the truth hurts. But but when you were inside, then it was great. And one one story I remember, which is not funny, but I like it. Uh, I was a vegetarian at that time. And now I'm a vegan. And uh, John Spielman's always been a vegetarian. Maybe he's a vegan now. I don't know, but probably just a vegetarian. And he ordered some some food that was some kind of vegetarian calzone. And I was sitting at the table with him and he, he said, this is great. You should try some. And he almost gave me all of his calzone. And I said, well, this is your calzone. Like you shouldn't give me like 90% of it. You should, you know, it is good. I agree. Right. But he's a very generous person. He wanted to hook up another fellow vegetarian. But there's so many stories from that event because there's so many super strong grandmasters. And Fred Lindsay asked Valerie Salov at that tournament, are there any strong Russian players we haven't heard of who are going to be really strong in the future? And remember, this was 1988. And he said, Vasily Ivanchuk. Okay. And neither one of us had heard of Ivanchuk. Me, me and Fred never heard of him. He was an IM. And a month after that tournament, he played the New York Open and he won clear first as an IM. So Salov was right. And then the rest is history. Were you in New York for that tournament? or? Were... Uh, that's a good question. No, I wasn't. I wasn't okay. in New York. And Although funny, you... funnily, Ray Stone was the other guy who was staying with us, and he played Ivanchuk in the first round. Oh, wow. So that's sort of funny, too, that he says Ivanchuk, and then Ray plays him, and then he wins the tournament. Then he becomes like one of the greatest superstars ever. So that's, I mean, Salov was right. He knew what he was talking about. Yeah. I, I mean, I remember I, I read uh, Dirk Jantan Guzendum's uh, book, Lenaris Lenaris, which is like a fun sort of... Uh, you know, year by year retrospective of that tournament, which gives you a little slice of sort of like the rising stars. And I know that Ivan one of the greatest like, games ever is Ivan Chuk tearing apart Kasparov in that Sicilian. Right. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's one of the greatest games ever. Yeah. I and, mean, Kasparov with his queen on H8 and all his pieces couldn't move. 
And I was like, man, Ivan Chuk must be good. Yeah. Yeah. And so have you met him in person, Ivan Chuk? I've never spoken to Ivan Chuk, but I've seen him at a few tournaments. Okay. But we've, we've never chatted. And obviously you're a busy guy with your streaming. We'll get into your summer plans later, but like does reminiscing about going to events and seeing top players, like would it feel the same to you if you were, how would you feel if you were just a spectator at Norway chess, which is ongoing as we record? Oh yeah, that would, that would be great. Yeah. I so, mean, because I, Go just ahead. like when I went to Tilburg, I wanted to see the tournament. Yeah. Right. But I, I feel like, I don't know. I feel like some of the luster maybe has been lost. Like when I interviewed, um, when I, when I, when I talked about uh white can Z, um, you know, they talk about how all the players used to be in the hotel bar, but now it's like more professionalized. Uh, do you mm -hmm. feel that some of the element of just seeing people everywhere and them not having handlers and them not preparing all the time? Like, do you think it would feel the same? No, it's better when you can when you can see the players um, and hang out with them, of course. I don't know how much different it is now than before. However, that reminded me of a good story. In 1979, my family drove to Montreal to watch the Montreal tournament. And we got autographs from some of the players. That was one of the first big super tournaments. And my dad, my, I was nine years old. My, my dad said, let's go to this hotel. It's the best hotel in Montreal and walk around and see if we see any players. Didn't know they were staying there. He just said, this is the best hotel. Okay. So we went there and we walked around like in the lobby and in, like where shops were. And, and we saw uh, Robert Hubner and my dad talked to him for like 15 minutes. Nice. He was glad to talk to somebody about chess. And I was like, man, I wouldn't even have thought of that. Like, I don't know where the players are staying. Let's guess this hotel and see if we could find one of them. And he did. So that's, that's amazing. You know, but yeah, it was cool. It's cool. Like in St. Louis, obviously, when they have these big events like U.S. Championship and Sinkfield Cup, U.S. Women's Championship, U.S. Junior, Senior, and you can sometimes you can just hang out with the players in the chess club. And one time when Archer was about five or six years old, uh, Fabi said, let's play some bug house. And wow. we have video of Archer and Fabi playing bug house just in the chess club because they're just hanging around. And that's, you know, you don't, you don't get those kind of experiences um, unless you go to tournaments and the players are available, as you said, as opposed to like being with their handlers. And Magnus was always like that. Magnus was almost never available. But luckily, since I'm a GM, I was at some of the after stuff. So I, I saw those guys, you know, loosen up and, you know, and party and such where there wasn't really access for the typical person, but I have I have a lot of that experience with hanging out with the top players and and seeing the lighter side. Yeah, you told uh, you told the story in one of our interviews of uh, showing just showing some of your games to Magnus. I mean, that must have mm -hmm. been surreal. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah, and Magnus what? isn't my biggest fan. Oh, really? So I think I think then I think then we were OK. What happened? Well, I, oh, think, I, I think I know what happened, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I think in the you know, in I. I was very negative about his withdrawing from the Sinkfield Cup. Right. In, in, in my opinion, if somehow Magnus is 100% right, if, which I don't think he's right, but if he's right, I, I don't see why he withdrew from the tournament. Yeah. Like, he's not going to play Hans again. Nobody else did anything. What, why isn't he play? He's basically ruining the tournament by leaving. He's the big attraction. And making people have buys every round – and him not being there and it's just all of a sudden was, was weird. Yeah. So I, I don't like the way he handled it even based on the way he felt, which is, I just got cheated. Right. And I felt like that a lot online. And then usually the next day I reconsider, I'm like, yeah, they probably weren't cheating. I'm probably just a crazy old man. So I think, I think I'm a crazy old man more than people are cheating. But when you think somebody's cheating, it's very upsetting. It's hard to not be emotional about it. But yeah, as we saw the negative things I'd said about Magnus leaving the tournament and the fact that I think Hans didn't cheat in that game, you know, Magnus isn't my biggest fan. So Luckily, you... Magnus never thinks about me, so it doesn't matter. Right. But you you have heard that? Uh, no, but I'm, I'm I'm sure of it. I'm sure Magnus knows the way I what I've said and and doesn't like it. I don't know when he was on the Lex Friedman podcast and, you know, Lex asked him for his favorite YouTube channels. He, he just mentioned mm -hmm. Agadmater 
And he sounded like kind of shockingly checked out of chess YouTube to me. I, I wouldn't be so sure that he knows what you mm -hmm. said. Yeah. Well, um, let, let's hope not. Okay. And one other thing I wanted to add about like attending these tournaments when I was saying maybe it's not the same, I do really appreciate that places like the Norway Open and the aforementioned American Chess Festival, like I love when they do turn it into a festival when, mm -hmm. when yes, you can attend the tournament, but then there's also a tournament you can play in and there's events like that, that can make it so that even though you might not have like, you know, great access to these chess celebrities and, uh, you know, amazing players, like you also have a wide variety of activities to do. You know, what? one of the things I've enjoyed the most in the last few years of, of me being a chess player is when I go to tournaments and I quote unquote work at the tournament, like I just went last month to Baltimore for the National Elementary Championship. I was one of the guest GMs along with Zalugi and we did simuls and bug house and blitz and lectures and you know, stuff like that is you don't realize, you know, how many fans you have. People want selfies. People want autographs. People tell me they love my channel. And I hear that a lot when I go to tournaments. And it makes me feel better about myself that I've actually accomplished something in life that people enjoy. Because, you know, if you're just at home streaming, people are watching your stream and half of them are trash talking. Right. And, you know, you don't feel like there's a community that really that really loves you and enjoys what you're doing. But when I go to live tournaments, I expect because of how abrasive I am sometimes on my stream and in general, that I'm going to hear some negative feedback. Like my daughter was watching your channel and all of a sudden you said some of these swear words and my daughter's only seven. That's what I expect. That never happens. And instead they're like, my son and daughter watch your channel. And I'm like, your son's six. <laughs> how is he watching my channel? And you're not complaining to me. That's, that's what I'm expecting. So people do enjoy watching, uh, my content and they tell me so. And that's, that's a real enjoyable part of going to these tournaments is seeing that people actually do like the chess content that I'm putting out. Yeah. It's weird how so much sort of online hate is stuff that no one would say to you in real life, you know? Yeah. No, I never get, in fact, somebody once at a tournament said you banned me on your stream, but they thought it was funny. <laughs> they weren't complaining. They were just like, that's funny. And I was like, all right. I've been so many people. I don't know who you are. <laughs> You've got a quick trigger finger. Yeah. Someone uh, yeah. in Twitter replies was lamenting that you'd been blocked. They'd been blocked uh, by you uh, unjustly in their mind. It was very just. <laughs> you stand by your actions. All right. Um, and Ben, so you mentioned your content. You've got a new chessable course out on 1D4. First of all, mm -hmm. why why 1D4? Why this? Uh, this it's starting out with D4. D4 is a move that I've played almost all of my life. And I wanted to do something I had knowledge about. And I knew that if I did this course, that I would actually learn a lot myself about these opening variations and what I've been doing my whole life. And I worked over five months on this course. This is the most chess work I've done on one course in my life. And it's the hardest I've worked. And I wanted it to be accurate where somebody's not going to complain on chessable. Hey, I uh, move seven. My engine says this move wins for black. Your line is crap. That's not going to happen because I use several engines plus my own judgment. And it took me a long time to make sure the moves were all correct and try to give the most um, variations from my opponent's side, even if they were bad to show how to punish it. And I think, you know, for me playing D4 for the last 30 years, um, I really had a good idea of what I wanted to do in the course and what variations I wanted to show and, you know, just relearn the stuff that I've been doing my whole life. Yeah. I'm sure you learned a ton, uh, in, in like, cause as you've mentioned, I mean, you're primarily, you're playing blitz, you know, you're doing all your mm -hmm. events and your lectures. So like to go that deep the way, on the theory. I don't want to interrupt you, although I do. When I was making the chessable course and I'm still making it, um, I was always playing my chessable lines in my stream in blitz games and saying, this is in my chessable course. This is telling the audience. And then I'm like, okay, that moves down in the chessable course. Like my opponent will make some move that in one instance, they made a move that like hung material, <clears throat> which I actually mentioned in my chessable course, this move hangs material. You can't huh. do that. 
that my opponent did that instead of playing the main line. Okay. And, you know, that way I can see how the openings are doing in my blitz games and people can see what I cover in my chess level course. And I get to use it to help myself also. And when you take, like when you do a course like this, are you remembering a lot of the moves that you, um, that you come across? Cause obviously I'm sure you're learning, like, even though you've know this stuff well for playing it from 30 years, you're learning or coming across many new moves. Do you sort of automatically remember it if you come across one or does it take work for you to remember it? Yeah. I mean, I remember stuff that I've done and then I remember the better lines that I haven't done yet. Okay. I'm like, wait, I don't, that's not what I do, but that's the best line. So I can tell when I know something and when I don't know it. And when I don't know it, and it's the right line. That's the line that I'm giving in my, and I, there's actually one particular game where uh, I was playing. Uh, wow. His, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Sarkar, Justin Sarkar. Okay. I can't remember his name for a second. That's, that's what happens when you get older, Ben, you'll, you'll see. So I was playing Justin Sarkar and it's all the way to the end of my chessable line. And I said, this is the best move. And then I'm like, unfortunately, against Justin Sarkar, this is like, you know, more than 10 years ago, I played this and I was lucky to draw. But if I had played this, then I have a nice advantage. And so I'm like, I'm like, yeah, against Sarkar, I remember I didn't, I didn't know this position at the time. And I, and I played it wrong. And this happened in a game with a Kobe and also where I, my chessable course recommends an improvement over the way that I played. I drew that game also. I guess I draw a lot of games. Um, but yeah, it's fine if it's fun. It's fun to find improvements in your opening play from games you played 10, 20 years ago. And that's going to make sense because, you know, the engines 20 years ago weren't so good. Yeah. So now now everything's better and we can play better and we can study better. Excellent. Yeah. And the course should be out possibly the same day this pod is out. Definitely uh, coming soon. Yeah. Now, I think so. June, tw June 12th. Yeah. yeah. Which is when the pod will be out. So but let me ask you, Ben. So. I want to dig deeper on the one D four thing. Like, do you have, do you have a philosophical preference for D four over E four? Is it sort of just you played it more? I think when I was starting to figure out what openings to play, because when I was a little kid, I was playing C four. And then between like the ages of nine and 14, I just played everything. I played D four, C four, E four, knight F three, B three. And I still sort of do that, but I'm playing 90% D4 in my slow tournament games. And I just found I understood that the best for me, and I had the best results, that it was easier for me to play. That's that's a me thing. For other people, it could be they prefer to play E4 and they like that. Like Peter Laco, who I just did a, a class on, like he, he plays E4, he understands that. Boy, does he understand that uh, for both sides. So I think it's just a matter of taste. and. I played a lot of different openings growing up and I gravitated to D4 because that seemed to be what spoke to me. Okay. Um, but you're not going to say it's just better, you know, it's not. No, no, no. Okay. No, um, no I, uh, first moves, they're all about the same as far as evaluation. It's ones that you understand and you get good positions with and you enjoy playing. And sometimes I get sick of D4, so I just play something else. I'm like, here's E4, here's B3, just to play something new. Do you think but, it helped your development as a kid that you played all those different like first moves? I think so, because I got to decide what I wanted to play instead of having a coach tell me what's, how to play their repertoire or what they like to play. I, I figured out for myself what I enjoyed playing. And, you know, obviously I learned chess from my dad. He was a master and he he played all kinds of different openings and wasn't a theoretician. So he didn't tell me play this opening or that opening. He didn't think that, that was important. So we played a lot of blitz chess together, but there wasn't any opening study. Okay. And I, I gather that you agree with his philosophy. Yeah. I think you, the, each individual person should find the opening that speaks to them or the variations they like and not necessarily, you know, have a, have a coach say, I play the Dutch defense. You should play it too. Right. That's not, that's not the way I teach chess. I think you should play what you like, what you enjoy playing. And if you don't like it, you can always switch up. That's the great thing about chess. If you play D4 and you start hating it, you can play E4. And a lot of the top players in the world 
are very flexible in the openings they play. They'll play, you know, two or three different ways in any variation, just depending on their mood. Okay. And we got another opening question for you, Ben, from the Patreon mailbag. This one is from longtime supporter Tyron Ross Price. Thanks for supporting the pod, Tyron. And he mentions that Mark Esserman has a fine gold refutation chapter in Mayhem and the Mora, which is also mm-hmm. available on Chessable. All speaking of like openings that speak to people, people who play the Smith Mora love the Smith Mora. So right. he asks if you have a refutation to the fine gold refutation. Um, and when well, I haven't read Mayhem and the Mora, but I've seen that it exists. And the the Feingold defense book was written in the year 2000. Wow. So I know it's amazing how long ago it was <laughs> with co-author with Bob Schifoni. And uh, what's funny is when I play Blitz Chess against lower rated players on chess.com, I try to play the Mora because I think it's fun. I would never play it in a slow game, but... In Blitz Chess, I'll play the Mora with white. And with black, I'm playing the Fine Gold defense still. And so far, nothing bad has happened. I, I get good positions out of the openings. Often, I'm just a pawn up for nothing. And it wasn't really me that discovered this way of playing. Schifoni discovered it and wanted me to co-author a book with him. And he said, I can't call it the Schifoni defense because nobody will buy the book. <laughs> but I've played it a lot since the book has come out, which is a long time ago. But I haven't done any serious study in the last few years on that variation. So I can't really speak to what Esserman said. But Esserman himself, I think, doesn't doesn't even think that the more is the best line for white. He just enjoys playing it. And he enjoys his great success because he really understands it. I mean, and that's that's why Esserman's so good at the Mora. That speaks to him. That's the right. kind of chess he wants to play. And you know, there's probably some lines he doesn't like to face more than others, but he knows more about it than his opponent. And that's that's what you want in an opening is, you know, the opening and your opponent doesn't. And that's definitely what he's getting a lot of the time. Yeah. And at his level as an I am, obviously, he's strong enough where maybe it's not optimal for his results, although maybe it is. But I know he has sort of like a cult following in the Smith Moore. And I feel mm-hmm. like for everyone below 2000, like it has to be a very good choice if you if you know it that well and you're excited about it because no I agree no, yeah no Sicilian player wants to face it you know no I think if you can get the initiative early in the game with white or black against players your own rating at the club level that's going to be really good for you um, most players below two thousand aren't great defenders that's one of the biggest weaknesses in their game is de- defending is not their strong suit and. If you enjoy playing those lines, those are just the right lines for you. And I don't want to force somebody to do it. Some people don't want to be a pawn down. They don't want to play the Smith Mora. So there's no reason to do that. And is the, aside from this D4 course, is there an opening that you feel like really speaks to you? Do you have a personal favorite, Ben? I think my personal favorite throughout my career with White, at least, is the Queen C2 Nimzo Indian. I've been playing since I was 14. And I think the Nimzo Indian is maybe the biggest chapter in my course because I really dive deep into the Queen C2 Nimzo Indian because I have so many games and so many memories of things that happened that were good. And that's the opening I think I know the best um, of all openings just because I've played it for so long and I've had good results throughout the years. Yeah, it's uh, still topical. I mean, you still see it all mm-hmm. the time at the uh, at the top levels. And um, speaking of the top levels, I don't want to cover Norway chess too much because it'll, I mean, it seems like we probably know who's going to win. But nonetheless, like, you know, storylines will develop subsequent to between when this records and when this comes out. But it looks like Fabiano's back at number two in the world live rankings. And more likely than not, he will win this tournament. Do you does mm-hmm. that surprise you? Did you did you think when he fell to number 14 that he would rise again? I wasn't sure because that seemed crazy to me that he would not be in the top 10. That's not the Fabi that I know. Even dropping out of the top five is weird for me. So it was surprising when he fell down so so fast. But it's not surprising to me that he's playing well again because he's always capable of just having a great tournament. And a lot of chess isn't classical chess anymore. So a lot of the ratings aren't aren't changing very much. And some people 
like Anand are doing well by not playing. They're staying in the top 10 by not, right. not playing in tournaments, which is funny. Um, yeah, I'm not surprised that he, you know, came back. And, you know, it's I was surprised when he fell to 14. That was shocking to me because I don't think of Fabi as somebody who's not top 10 and probably not even not top five. He's He's, he's just always top five to me. Yeah. And obviously he and Christian have been busy pumping out content for the C squared podcast, but it's good mm -hmm. to see that that's not holding back his chess skills. Apparently he's still finding some time to study. Exactly. Um, and what about the Magnus of it all? I mean, there's been some talk, you know, I got a, the aforementioned Alex Fishbein. I have to give him props when I interviewed him last year and he was vocal about this on Facebook as well. As soon as Magnus retired, he said, you know, he's going to fall off. He's not going to be as strong. And, I was skeptical at the time. Obviously, the final story has not been told, but he's not playing at the same level. Uh, do, does that surprise you, Ben? Or at least not achieving the same results, I should say. No, I think he's not um, putting all of his energy in the chess. And I think people like Fisher and Kasparov and Magnus put all their energy in the chess, and they, they got to the top. And once you stop putting all your energy in chess and living your life and relaxing and having fun, then your, your chest is going to suffer. And I don't think that's a negative thing for Magnus. I think he wants to live his life and do what he wants to do. He's already been best player in the world for 10 years or more. So he doesn't see any reason to be the best player in the world for 20 years. He'd rather do other stuff and he wants to play for fun. So it's not surprising that he's not doing as well as he used to. Having said that, He's still the best player in the world. Right. He's just not way the best player in the world. He's, you know, the best player in the world. But yeah, he he had a bad blitz tournament in Norway. He came in seventh. He's not doing well in this tournament. In the classical portion, he's minus one. But, you know, if people are working hard uh, and you're not, that's going to show. And Dmitry Gurevich, it's a funny story. On, on ICC, about 20 years ago, uh, Mark Ginsburg was playing Eric Lobron blitz chess, and Mark Ginsburg was winning. And I said to Dmitry Gurevich, Mark Ginsburg can't win against Lobron. That doesn't make any sense. And I told him how good Lobron was. And, he, and Dmitry said, you don't stay the same in chess. He says, either you get better or you get worse. There's no staying the same. Yeah. Well, if you're like not taking chess seriously, which Lobron hasn't in 20 years, but he might take some drinking seriously, but not, <laughs> not doesn't take chess seriously anymore, then he's not going to be the same strength. It's going to get worse. And Magnus can't be 2870 and then play poker half the time and go out partying half the time and be 2870. He's he either has to work really hard and try to get his rating up, or he has to have fun in his life his rating goes down. And I don't begrudge him for that. He's he's already proven all he has to in chess. Now he's got other stuff he wants to do, and he wants to play chess for fun. And he's not going to do, like, with five coaches and prepare for three weeks for a tournament. That's just not, you know, that's not what he wants to do anymore. Yeah, he doesn't owe us anything. I, I It's a good point. Yeah, he's just living his life. Yeah. yeah. And um, But Hakaro, meanwhile, is kind of like a weird example, because obviously not quite at Magnus's level, but why do you think it is that he is managing to maintain his level? It's funny. I think a lot of it is is how relaxed he is. You know, he goes to the tournament and he's like, I'm a streamer. This is for fun. And I think he still studies the openings a lot because his opening play seems better than it used to be. And he still works. He still works with Little John. And he doesn't play in a lot of turn, a lot of slow tournaments. So when he does play, he's hungry. And I think people who just play, you know, every week, like Jay Bonin used to do, you know, it's it becomes monotonous at some point. So he's not he's not playing in these tournaments for the money. He's not playing to become world champion. He's playing because he likes to play chess and he wants to play in a tournament every now and then and get some accolades. So I think he's just much more relaxed about his chess than he was, you know, 10 years ago.
Yeah, it's it's amazing to see. I mean, and and yeah, he no, does. No, it is that he can keep his level with just playing blitz chess online, basically. Yeah, although, and to be fair, playing it a ton and playing the title Tuesday, playing a lot of good players too. Yeah, yeah. A lot of these rapid tournaments, everybody's really good. And Ben, out of these young bucks, uh, I know you've done a uh, you've done video series on a few of them, like Faruja. Um, is there? Like, who would you peg as if if you were to bet on one person to be the next world champion? Let's see. Out of the top junior players, uh, like two years ago, I would have told you Nihal Saren. And probably now. I think two uh, years ago, you did tell me Nihal Saren. <laughs> did I? Well, you, you mentioned him. You mentioned that you thought Maybe. he was a bigger talent than yeah. Prague. Yeah. I guess of all the top Indian talents, and I'll throw in Abdu Sitarov as somebody else, probably Iragasi is the, I think, is the one with the best chance. Wow. Okay. Yeah, Arjun. Yeah. Yeah, he seems incredibly good. And Magnus, a close I... second to Gukesh. Okay. Magnus yeah, has so been Iragasi and Gukesh. Magnus seems to be a fan of Abdu Sitarov's fighting spirit in particular. Mm-hmm. And what Abdu about... Abdu Sitarov is really good. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me either. There's a lot of good junior players now. Yeah. And what about the older guard? I mean, obviously, people like Caruana and Geary seem to have a high chance of making the candidates. We know Nepo will be there. Um, we don't know much beyond that in terms of uh, who exactly will get to play. But if you were to pick just the next candidates winner, probably focusing on the people we know, uh, who would you favor? The next candidates winner. I don't know. Probably the safe pick is Fabi. Yeah. I think he's the safe pick. If he plays in the candidates, I don't yeah. know if he's qualified. Uh, yeah. But I mean, I think this Norway chess, I think all these formats are so convoluted, mm -hmm. but it counts towards yeah. the Grand Prix points, which count towards uh, the candidates. Yeah. So um, we'll probably play the next candidates. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll pick Fabi. Um, yeah, it'll it'll be interesting to see. I mean, I would love for him to uh, Fabi Ding. If Fabi match. plays a match with Ding, Fabi will probably be the favorite. Yeah, I would uh, I would think so too. Mm -hmm. Um Okay, and last topic, Ben. So you mentioned you've got the American Open coming up. Um shout out to Karen. National Open. National. national. Sorry. <laughs> I always, always do that. I apologize <laughs> to the, the National Open organizers. Um and <laughs> shout out to Karen who recently qualified for the World Series main event, uh World Series of Poker. Now I know you've had some interest in poker over the years. We've played together way back in the day. Um mm -hmm. what's gonna be your role while Karen's playing poker? What are you gonna do? I'll I'll be I'll be playing poker. Cash games or tournaments or um, mainly cash games. I might get into one tournament, although the lines are scaring me, but I'll be playing poker when she's playing poker. Probably I'll play 90% or more cash games and she probably won't play any cash games. She likes tournaments a lot more than I do. And I like cash games a lot more. So, and what, what's your typical cash game? I just play either one, two or one, three, no limit buy in for 300 or 400, whatever. Wow. So buy. grounded as a big time chess streamer. Mm -hmm. Do you win? Well, What's that? Are you a winning sometimes player? Sometimes I win, sometimes I lose, but I, I I go on tilt a lot in my own mind, not because I'm doing badly. I have like my own tilt, so I have to I have to I have to be more calm. And as always been the case in my poker career, I play great the first hour, then my play goes downhill. So maybe I should cash out after an hour. Right. I was going to say that's a good reason to play cash. Yeah. Games. Get, get some lunch. <laughs> um and. What else? Do you have any other chess events uh, on the docket? Um, no, I got, we got, and, and Karen hasn't played chess in a long time because she's been focusing on poker. And about once a month, we go to Cherokee in North Carolina and play poker. And sometimes they have WSOP circuit events and Karen plays in those. So we, and, we know more about the poker scene now than the chess scene. That's funny. And when Karen, as far, so as far as playing in tournaments. So when so for listeners who didn't hear it, I did an adult improver interview with uh, Ben's wife, Karen Boyd, um, probably about a year ago, where she did mention she was spending three to four hours working on chess in addition to competing all the time. The summer had just concluded, so she had played in the World Open and all these events. So mm -hmm. is she like, obviously, you have to travel to play poker. Um, but is so is she channeling that time into actual study? And if so, what does that study even look like these days? Yeah, her her study is is dedicated to poker now. Um, 
So she buys courses and watches videos and joins groups where people are talking about poker. And uh, she has poker coaches that you know, teach classes with a lot of students. Um, and she's studying, you know, tables and all kinds of things I don't understand that are mainly for tournaments because she really wants to play well in the tournaments. Um, she likes tournaments more than cash. And I mean, she studies poker probably more than she studied chess and she wow. was studying chess a lot, right? but she's, she studies poker almost all day. Amazing. Well, shout out to Karen. We'll definitely be rooting for her. Um, I mean, that's how you get good at stuff is you work at it. Yeah. You don't see somebody else do it and say, I can do that. There's, there's a reason why people make it to the NBA and the NFL and the final table of the world series because they're working hard. Yeah. Speaking of the NBA, the other night you were streaming during the finals. So are you, are you somewhat checked out? I know you mentioned James Harden. No, I watch whenever I can, but I have my streaming schedule. Okay. So you'd think they would set the NBA finals around my streaming schedule, but you know what the commissioner, they're just not doing it. And when you do something like that, like, do you have a TV in the room? Are you ever checking out like a sporting event? No, no, I just do my stream. And then when my stream is done, I'll watch the rest of the game. Okay. Um, same with the Braves. I watch the Braves games, but you know, when I'm streaming, I'm streaming. Okay. And then I'll check the score on my phone. I'll see what the score is, but I'm not watching the game actively. Gotcha. All right. Well, Ben, it, it has been a pleasure as always. Anything to add about the chessable course in particular? Or like, are you going to do another chessable course, do you think? Or we'll see how this yeah, one goes Eventually, first. yeah. And also I have a master class that's related to the course that's going to happen at the end of July. And that's going to be on sale with the course. You can buy it as a bundle if you'd like. Excellent. But Ben, uh, thanks for your patience during our attempt to stream it. And always a pleasure to... <laughs> yeah, that was my fault. Sorry, Ben. No, that was... It's, it's all about us. All right. Thanks as always, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me again. <laughs>